Hey guys, it's Daniel. I've gotten a few messages from people lately asking if I could do a video on Frances Bean Cobain, Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love's only daughter. She was born on August 18, 1992 and tragically was less than two years old when her father died on April 5th of 94. Throughout this video, I'm going to be sharing with you quotes from Frances Bean where she discusses her thoughts on Nirvana, her father Kurt, what it was like for her emotionally growing up without him, and more. The first quote I want to share with you is from an interview Frances Bean did with journalist David Frick for Rolling Stone back in 2015. At one point in this interview, she says that although she grew up without Kurt, in a sense, he was always around her. Quote, I was around 15 when I realized he was inescapable. Even if I was in a car and had the radio on, there's my dad. He's larger than life and our culture is obsessed with dead musicians. We love to put them on a pedestal. He inspired people. He became even bigger after he died than when he was alive. You don't think he could have gotten any bigger, but he did. End quote. Now, Kurt Cobain had Irish ancestry. In 2018, a Kurt Cobain exhibit was opened in Kildare, Ireland, about 50 kilometers west of Dublin. Kurt's mother, Wendy, his sister, Kim, and Frances Bean attended the exhibit and did an interview together. The following is some of what Frances Bean had to say about her father during that interview. Quote, I didn't have a dad. That's horrible. I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. But I also wouldn't change the dynamic of anything in my life because it's informed the person I am and I really like the person I am. I think my dynamic with him is, is probably more similar to a fan's dynamic where it's almost like this untouchable thing. And all the information I have about him is secondhand. It's stories. He's kind of unavoidable in my life. You know what I mean? Like, it's hard for me to walk down a street and not see a Nirvana shirt every single day. So he's around me every day of my life, whether I want him to be or not. I get to remember him whether I want to or not. It's powerful because it humbles you. Because it's so far reaching. But at the same time, it sometimes feels a little bit frustrating on certain days. You know what I mean? Some days I'll be at a coffee shop, like just having a time, you know, just like having a moment. And all of a sudden he comes on and I'll be like, I can't even with you right now. I've definitely had emotional breakdowns like in Ubers and he's come on and I'll be like, I need you right now so much. So, you know, it plays out on different days in different ways. End quote. Growing up without a father had a big emotional impact on Francis, of course. On June 19th, 2022, Father's Day, Francis Bean said the following on her Instagram, quote, Today can be complicated for a lot of people, so I just thought I would share my yearly tradition for this day. I try to use whatever energy I'm feeling, sometimes sad, sometimes deeply wounded or lost, but in more recent years, curious and compassionate, to bring into the world something that hasn't previously existed through some kind of creative outlet. I like to believe that if something beautiful can coexist alongside something sad or complicated, then that allows for those emotions to be circulated with intention and meaning." End quote. Now, as Frances Bean mentioned, although she didn't grow up with Kurt around, she can't really escape him. His image and his music is everywhere. Interestingly, on the subject of his music, Frances Bean once said that she actually doesn't like Nirvana's music that much, that she isn't a big fan of the band, and that she prefers other bands such as Oasis. The following is from the Rolling Stone interview she did in 2015 with David Frick. Quote, I don't really like Nirvana that much. Sorry, promotional people, Universal. I'm more into Mercury Rev, Oasis, Brian Jonestown Massacre. The grunge scene is not what I'm interested in, but... Territorial Pissings is a great song. And Dumb, I cry every time I hear that song. It's a stripped down version of Kurt's perception of himself, of himself on drugs, off drugs, feeling inadequate to be titled the voice of a generation. The song Dumb was Kurt's projection, end quote. Dumb, of course, was released as the sixth track on In Utero. In Utero, Nirvana's final studio record was released on September 21st of 93, at the time the record was released, the band's lineup consisted of Kurt Cobain, Chris Novoselic, and Dave Grohl. Pat Smear would join Nirvana as their second guitarist during the band's In Utero tour. As a matter of fact, Pat Smear's first show with Nirvana took place just four days after the release of In Utero on September 25, 93. 
This show in September of 93 was another one of the band's performances on Saturday Night Live. In 2015, Francis Bean Cobain said the following about Pat Smear, Dave Grohl, and Chris Novoselic. Quote, Dave, Chris, and Pat once came over to a house where I was living. They look at me and you can see they're looking at a ghost. They were all getting the KC, Kurt Cobain, Jeebies, hardcore. Dave goes, she's so much like Kurt. They were all talking amongst themselves, rehashing old stories I'd heard a million times. I was sitting in a chair, chain smoking, looking down in boredom. And they went, you are doing exactly what your father would have. End quote. Now, when it comes to Kurt Cobain documentaries, the most famous one is, of course, Montage of Heck. Interestingly, Francis Bean Cobain is actually one of the executive producers of the film. The film had its international premiere at the Sundance Film Festival on January 24th, 2015, and its wider release on May 4th of 2015. About a month earlier, on April 8th, 2015, Rolling Stone released an interview with Francis Bean Cobain and journalist David Frick. At one point in this interview, Francis Bean Cobain shared her thoughts on Montage of Heck. Quote, It's emotional journalism. It's the closest thing to having Kurt tell his own story in his own words, by his own aesthetic, his own perception of the world. It paints a portrait of a man attempting to cope with being a human. When Brett, the director, and I first met, I was very specific about what I wanted to see, how I wanted Kurt to be represented. I told him, I don't want the mythology of Kurt or the romanticism. Even though Kurt died in the most horrific way possible, there is this mythology, this romanticism that surrounds him, because he's 27 forever. The shelf life of an artist or a musician isn't particularly long. Kurt has gotten into icon status because he will never age. He will always be relevant and always be beautiful. There is, with any great artist, a little maniacness and insanity. Tropic of Cancer is one of my favorite books. And author Henry Miller had this work ethic where he would get out of bed every day and force himself to write five pages. It taught me that if you do the work, you progress. So many people were content to settle. My dad was exceptionally ambitious, but he had a lot thrown on him, exceeding his ambition. He wanted his band to be successful, but he didn't want to be the voice of a generation. For me, the film provided a lot more factual information about my father not just tales that were misconstrued, misremembered, rehashed, retold 10 different ways. It was factual evidence of who my father was as a child, as a teenager, as a man, as a husband, as an artist. It explored every single aspect of who he was as a human being, end quote. Now, as mentioned a bit earlier, according to Francis Bean Cobain, one of the Nirvana songs which touches her the most emotionally is Dumb. Dumb was released as the sixth track on Nirvana's third studio record in utero in 1993. The song, however, was actually written back in the summer of 1990. As a matter of fact, the first known recording of Dumb took place on September 3rd of 91, two years before In Utero was released on September 21st of 93. The September 3rd, 1991 version of Dumb was recorded during a studio session for the BBC in London. Interestingly, my birthday is actually September 2nd, 1991. So, the first known Nirvana recording to have taken place in my lifetime is dumb. Now, Francis Bean Cobain was born on August 18th of 1992. As of the time of this posting, she is 30 years old. As a matter of fact, the day this YouTube video was posted is September 18th of 2022. Exactly one month after her 30th birthday. Obviously, one of the things that's interesting about Francis Bean turning 30 is that she reached a milestone her father didn't. Given the fact he famously died at 27, it's a bit strange in a way to think that his daughter is now in her 30s. Reflecting on turning 30, Francis Bean posted the following on Instagram. Quote, I made it. Honestly, 20-year-old Francis wasn't sure that was going to happen. At the time, an intrinsic sense of deep self-loathing dictated by insecurity destructive coping mechanisms, and more trauma than my body or brain knew how to handle, informed how I saw myself and the world, through a lens of resentment for being brought into a life that seemingly attracted so much chaos and the kind of pain tied to grief that felt inescapable. Then, an event on a plane which brought me closer in proximity to death is ironically the event that catapulted me towards running at this lived experience with radical gratitude. 
I'm glad to have proven myself wrong and to have found ways to transform pain into knowledge. There's a quote by Dr. Jaya John I hold closely, which is, The softer she became with herself, the softer she became with the world. It's a sentiment I try to remember daily. Entering this new decade, I hope to stay soft no matter how hardening the world can feel at times. Bask in the present moment with reverence. Shower the people I am lucky enough to love with more appreciation than words could ever do justice and hold space to keep learning. So growth never stops. I'm happy to be here. And I'm happy you're here too. End quote. The event on a plane, which France is being referred to, was an incident which took place on a flight she was on in 2017. On September 30th of 2017, one of the wings of an airplane Francis Bean was on caught fire. Though the plane thankfully didn't crash, it was still a scary experience nonetheless. In October of 2017, Francis Bean Cobain said the following on Instagram, quote, I've avoided talking about this because telling strangers struck me as a fruitless endeavor. But enough time has gone by to where I've sat with what this experience should mean on the grand scale of living my day-to-day -day life. So, here it goes. A week ago, on September 30th, I boarded Air France flight A380. The irony is, I changed my previously booked flight to this one that very day so I can get home earlier. This would act as the moment that would alter everything I thought I knew. I have woken up every day for the past week just grateful to wake up. When I felt the plane tilt, saw the wing directly in front of me catch fire, and basically came to grips with my own mortality... I made myself a deal. I promised myself that if I made it through, that I would no longer try to escape the moments of my life. So I've entered the phase of my life where every moment is truly precious. All the mundane, crippling anxieties I once let dictate how I functioned have dissipated. I was jolted awake and awake is where I need to stay in order to live authentically. As cheeseball as that sounds, it resonates. End quote. Around this point in her life during the airplane incident, Frances Bean was also sober. Growing up without a father had its emotional toll on Frances, and contributed in part to her drinking. Frances Bean struggled for a period of her life with alcohol, but became sober in February of 2016. In February of 2018, she said the following on Instagram, quote, February 13th, 2018, my second sober birthday. It's an interesting and kaleidoscopic discussion to share my feelings about something so intimate in a public forum. The fact that I'm sober isn't really public knowledge, decidedly and deliberately. But I think it's more important to put aside my fear about being judged or misunderstood, or typecast as one specific thing. I want to have the capacity to recognize and observe that my journey might be informative, even helpful, to other people who are going through something similar or different. It is an everyday battle to be in attendance for all the painful, bizarre, uncomfortable, tragic, messed up things that have ever happened or ever will. How we treat our bodies directly correlates to how we treat our souls. It's all interconnected. It has to be. I'm going to take today to celebrate my vibrant health and the abundance of happiness, gratitude, awareness, peace, and the maraud of other messy emotions I feel constantly. They inform who I am, what my intentions are, who I want to be, and they force me to acknowledge my boundaries and limitations. As cheesy and cornball as it sounds, life does get better if you want it to. I claim my mistakes as my own because I believe them to contribute to the dialogue of my higher education in life. I am constantly evolving. The moment I stop my evolution is the moment I disservice myself and ultimately those I love. I'll never claim I know something other people don't. I only know what works for me and seeking to escape my life no longer works for me, end quote. Frances Bean Cobain, like her parents, is an artistic person. Though she has dabbled in music to an extent, she hasn't fully embraced being a musician, at least not yet. She has done a variety of various things in the creative world, including some modeling and visual artwork. In a 2018 interview with journalist Rima Shahune for W Magazine, Frances Bean touched on her artistry and what it's like for her being the daughter of one of the world's most famous musicians. Quote, I get to navigate my life in a very normal way. People don't follow me around and they don't stop me in a way where it's excessive or invasive. It's always respectful. If it's not, I set my boundaries and I walk away. That's just what you kind of have to do. But most people are really nice. 
and when you're nice, I have no reason not to just engage as a person. We're all just people. I had a lot of strong women around my whole life who were survivors. My grandma survived breast cancer twice, and the death of her child, and the death of her brother. And, you know, just a lot of tragedy. And she's still the happiest person I've ever met. Having an immediate example of somebody who not only survives but thrives is a good way of navigating how I coexist in the world with negative stuff and beautiful stuff and how it balances. It just comes from a place of learning and wanting to grow and evolve. Growing up, I would doodle on my desk. The Descendants mascot Milo, I was obsessed with drawing him. And then I started really enjoying creating warped, beautiful things that came from my brain, not based on reality at all. I've always felt more comfortable in fantasy. Fantasy has felt more real to me at times. Drawing was an immediate outlet for that, to create. It's been my ability to create my own world. I also really enjoy the aesthetic of building my fashion sense. I enjoy the process of going through fashion phases. I don't like the narcissism that comes with that world, though there are people who are negated from that way of thinking. Like my friend Jeremy Scott. He's the most brilliant, kind person. So people like him make me feel encouraged to be able to have fun with it and not allow it to be the epicenter of my universe. As long as I can keep it at arm's length, I really like it. End quote. When doing research for this video, I came across some details about Frances Bean's life which seem to have gotten a lot of attention, particularly her divorce. I'm sure some people may find those details interesting and want to hear more about it. But, at the same time, I don't think the details of her divorce and the related subject matter are things Frances willingly wanted the public to know so many details about. Given none of that stuff really adds anything to the conversation of her relationship with Kurt, I won't be discussing any of it here. In general, unless it's something important and relevant, unless it's something which really adds value to a story, I don't otherwise enjoy reporting on people's personal lives. I myself am a pretty private person. Now, if someone chooses to willingly mention something about their personal life publicly, that's a different situation. For example, there was a lot of controversy happening in Kurt Cobain's life around the time Francis Bean was born. Francis Bean Cobain was born on August 18, 1992, just a few days after she was born, the Department of Children and Family Services almost took custody of her. There were rumors that both Kurt and Courtney had been taking drugs throughout Courtney's entire pregnancy. Though Courtney in particular did use drugs early on in her pregnancy, according to several sources, once she learned she was pregnant, she stopped using. Regardless, Frances Bean Cobain was almost taken away from Kurt and Courtney just a few days after she was born. Of all the craziness at the time, the most infuriating episode for Kurt was the now infamous Vanity Fair article. On September 1st, 1992, journalist Lynn Hirschberg published an article in Vanity Fair titled Strange Love, the story of Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love. This article absolutely infuriated Kurt and Courtney. The article stated that Courtney Love had been using heroin for several months while pregnant. In response to the article, Kurt Cobain sent a letter in 1992 to David Geffen, the head of Nirvana's record label, DGC. In this letter, Kurt Cobain stated how enraged he was about the Vanity Fair article and that Nirvana is second in importance to him after his family. This is a segment from that letter. Quote, Dear David Geffen, Hi, my name is Kurt Cobain. I'm the lead singer, guitar, and songwriter for the band Nirvana. Supposedly, I've made your company a lot of money. Oh well, it was never a goal of mine to be part of the mainstream corporate world. But once I entered it, I realized that there are other employees, especially at DGC, who are as honest and sincere about music and have basically the same values as I have. I've never met you, I guess because I've never wanted to. Kind of a big boss phobia of mine. But something so severely defaming towards my family has come up in an article in Vanity Fair that has forced me to the side on breaking up my band. The article suggests that Courtney and I have been taking heroin continuously throughout her pregnancy, which is not true. Courtney found out she was pregnant within the first month of our drug binge. She stopped using and has since been visiting Danny Goldberg's pediatrician on a regular basis. The doctor's prognosis is that our child is in excellent health and there is no need to worry about anything. 
But this article has outright accused my wife of all kinds of hideously vile things to the point where I've never seen such a personal attack in a magazine. The woman's entire objective was to harm Courtney, and now after you read the article, I hope something may be done about it. I love my wife and soon-to-be new daughter too much to let everyone's low opinions of us ruin our lives together. I am in rehab going on 18 days, and I'm really looking forward to having a family. At this point, F Nirvana. I've never admitted to using drugs in articles because I don't want my fans to do the same. We are capable of displaying a healthy attitude before our audience, and the next record is easily as good as the last one. But I'm so extremely pissed off about this piece of trash journalism that I'll lay anything on the line for the love of my wife and daughter. End quote. Now, of course, Kurt didn't actually break up Nirvana, but this goes to show how upset he was. Now, in response to Kurt, David Geffen faxed Kurt Cobain this reply. Quote, Kurt, I know that you are upset about the recent article on Courtney and the attacks made on her character. I sympathize with what you're going through and how it can affect you. The press have a way of sabotaging your privacy. The thing you have to remember is that these things pass, and people quickly forget about articles of this type. You just have to let your life go on. End quote. This quote is from December of 1992. Quote, I've never read an article that was more convincing yet more ridiculous in my life than the Vanity Fair article. Everyone from our record label to our management to our closest friends believed it. The author did a really good job of taking a piece of what Courtney had said and turning it into something completely different. I've seen that happen before. It's happened with me a lot of times, but this was such an extreme and done so well that I have to give her credit. She's a master at being catty. Courtney was honest about the heroin excursion we went on for a few months. Then Courtney found herself pregnant, realized she was pregnant, and had a drug problem and got off drugs. It's as simple as that. But it made it look like eight months after the fact, Courtney was nine months pregnant and still doing drugs and everyone was really concerned. Like there was some awful den inquiry going on in our apartment. I looked really skinny. Well, I am a skinny person and I gain 10 pounds every time I'm photographed. So people assume I'm this chunky, normal weight person. I'm just so tired of thinking about this. We have to live with the results of this one article every day. It's something we have to deal with all the time. I was totally pissed off. My first thoughts were to have her snuffed out. I've never wanted to do that to anybody, especially a woman, but I just had so much anger in me. It was done so well. We were just helpless to combat something like that. We've had to do fluff pieces to try to fight this thing. It's embarrassing to have to do that. To pose with your family on the cover of a magazine to hope that some people at least question the validity of Vanity Fair. And we've done a couple of other things. It pissed me off to the point of not even wanting to hate that much. We could have filed a lawsuit with Condé Nast, Vanity Fair's mother organization, but they have so many millions of dollars. They could have filibustered for 10 years and we wouldn't have come up with anything except losing most of our money. Don't believe everything you read. I always knew to question things. All my life, I never believed most things I read in history books and a lot of things I learned in school. But now I found out I don't have the right to make a judgment on someone based on something I've read. I don't have the right to judge anything. That's the lesson I've learned. 